Hi, my name is Dr. Eric Landrum from the Department of Psychology at Boise State University. And this is my screencast for my research method students about types of variables. Now, in prior screencasts, if you're watching these in order, you'll know that I've already used some of this, these terms because sometimes it's just hard to do things in a linear order. But I wanted to come back to these terms and kind of dig in at least for a couple of minutes and kind of give you some firm definitions of which we can uh, base the course in the semester on. And so you can kind of see a, a favorite of a Bart Simpson character in terms of a meme, not sure if independent variable or dependent variable. And quite honestly, this is one of these, these fundamental topics that at some level, uh, sci undergraduate psychology majors just need to memorize and get, get used to it and know it so well backwards and forwards they don't get it confused. And at first, it's really easy to get it confused because the words are so similar to one another. Other. So here, one, one differentiation I want to make in this types of variable screencast is the independent variable versus the dependent variable. And again, if you're watching other screencasts, you've already heard these terms. So the independent variable is that variable which we manipulate, have control over, or arrange. Now, in a classic type of true experiment, an RCT, randomized control trial, the independent variable would be our intervention, what is done to one of the groups of participants and the other group of participants are oftentimes held as a control group or a comparison group. And so uh, that's the classic version of that. So, and, the, and obviously it's the experimenter that has control over which group gets what version or condition of the study. But I wanted to mention that, that last part there a little bit. Uh, the independent variable are those variables that we manipulate, have control over, or arrange. So for example, gender is a very popular variable to study in psychology. However, we can't randomly assign individuals to their genders. They actually have those themselves. And so what we do then is that we call those subject variables, and you'll read about this more in your textbook, but uh, we can arrange people by gender. So we can arrange people by men and women. We can ask them to self-select on a survey. Uh, by the same token, and, and the subject variables are these traits, qualities, characteristics that we carry around with us. And so uh, Democrat, Republican, Independent uh, is, uh, I, I, I don't manipulate, I don't have control over that, but I can arrange people, or more properly, their responses and their behaviors by the category or the classification I'm interested in. So that, just remember that about independent variables. We manipulate, control, or arrange. Now, the dependent variable is that thing that we measure, and we're going to dig into this a little bit more in the screencast, uh, but the idea here is that here, th this is the thing that we don't have control over, that when our participant shows up to be in our study, we have no idea what the behavioral response is going to be, and that's the thing that we're going to measure. We tend to measure that either quantitatively or qualitatively, and we'll actually get into those terms here in a little bit in this screencast. Uh, another distinction that uh, is not necessarily mutually exclusive of the one prior to it, but I think it's important to think about are continuous variables versus discrete variables. And, and there is a fuzzy boundary here about when one becomes the other, and it's, it's kind of a judgment call in some situations. And so a continuous variable uh, where values fall along a continuum, and they can be any value along that continuum. So if I were to ask you your age and years, you might tell me you're 26 years old. You might tell me you're 25 years old, seven months. There's a, almost an infinite number of possible stops along the way in that number line. And if you want to, and I'm going to show you this in a minute, you could think about continuous variables along a number line. However, discrete variables fall into distinct categories. And again, this distinction is kind of fuzzy at times. And so if I were to ask you about your political affiliation on a survey, and I give you three checkboxes, Republican, Democrat, or Independent, that's a discrete variable where you're placing yourself into one category. There's not a continuum here. I mean, we could think about a continuum for uh, uh, political affiliation if we wanted to think about uh, liberal to conservative where you could mark yourself on a line between liberal and conservative but if you're checking a box and you're placing yourself in a category we're going to tend to call that a discrete variable and by the way just to be fair uh, with age and you'll see this again in a moment um, we could actually have check boxes for that and have young and old and of course we'd have to have important operational definitions for what defines young and old in fact here let's peek at that and so you can see the top 
top part of that, age is listed as a continuum. So, I, and this is going to be the typical way, although not always, but the typical way I might ask on a survey, how old are you? And you put in a number. I don't know what the upper range is. It, it varies. Uh, it might be older than 110. I'm not really quite sure. And for this example, it doesn't really matter. So you could be any, any spot along that number line from 0 to 110. That'd be a continuous variable. And you can see the exact same idea, age, but now it's listed as a discrete variable with checkboxes, young and old. And you can see here that we've had to operationally define what we mean. Otherwise, if you just leave young and old without any definition, uh, odds are we all have different varying definitions in our head of what young is and what old is. And so uh, you can see that you would check box the young if you're somewhere between 0 and 55 and old between uh, 56 and 110 or whatever that upper bound is. Now those are pretty big and broad categories. In fact, someone who's 18 and someone who's 54 might have very different attitudes, but they're going to be placed in the same age bracket. Okay, so this isn't always the case, but this is a good general rule. Generally speaking, if we can get it, we'd prefer continuous data over discrete data. I'll say that one again, although you could pause and rewind. Generally speaking, if we can get it, we're going to prefer continuous data over discrete data. Your age along a number line gives me much more information, mathematically speaking, than a checkbox on a scale. Now, having said that, sometimes a checkbox on a scale is perfectly appropriate. We're going to ask about male and female. That's a checkbox, you know, in that category. That's much more, that's much easier for a person to reply to than, let's say, a continuum of masculinity and femininity. And those terms may not exactly overlap with our uh, gender categories of male and female. And so. So it's, it, get, it can get complicated. It's fuzzy. Well, what if I had 16 checkboxes for age? Well, then that discrete variable is starting to look pretty continuous. And so there's no hard and fast rule, but these are the general concepts that I want you to try to capture. In terms of other types of variables, and I've already kind of uh, uh, previewed this, and I, I've talked about it in other screencasts, there are uh, quantitative variables and qualitative variables. So quantitative variables vary in amount. These are in terms of magnitude or scores or numbers. And for the most part, most psychologists deal with quantitative variables, although qualitative variables can be very informative. They have a great place in certain parts of research methods. Uh, but most psychologists have a bias towards quantitative because that's how we were trained. All right. So you should just be aware of that assumption that many of us make. And so a quantit a qu I'm sorry, a qualitative variable vary in kind or type. And really the best example of this would be a verbal response. And so, for, for instance, I could ask you on a survey on a scale of 1 to 10, how satisfied are you with parking services here at the university with one meaning you're uh, incredibly angry and you're and 10 meaning you're blissfully happy uh, that would be a quantitative variable where I'm trying to get a number or a score or a magnitude or I could ask you an open-ended survey uh, tell me about your parking experiences at this university where you you would write in your words you type them into the online survey and that those that's a qualitative variable so uh, I it's still they're all dependent variables. I'm still getting responses from participants. It's either, am I getting numbers or am I getting words? And that's typically uh, the way that we uh, demarcate that division between quantitative and qualitative. You know, to be honest with you, I'm, I'm not a qualitative researcher, although I can appreciate it. I've done qualitative research in terms of content analysis, but I want to give this a little bit of extra emphasis by a couple of research methods authors, Chris Cosby and Scott Bates. Qualitative research focuses on people behaving in natural settings and describing their world in their own words. Quantitative research tends to focus on specific behaviors that can be easily quantified, that is counted. I think that's a great depiction and it really shows you, I, I think the idea here would be when, when possible, um, you want to use both both approaches. In other words, you may not be doing that in your research methods class with me, but if you go on to do research either with a good job with a bachelor's degree or going to graduate school, uh, you, you know, using multiple approaches and multiple ways to measure the variables of interest makes a lot of sense because you can kind of, you know, oftentimes triangulate on an issue and really make sure that you're well-rounded in your understanding of both the quantitative and qualitative aspects of whatever problem you're studying.
And so, um, and, and I would highly recommend that as you continue in your psychology education to become a better acquainted with both approaches, both quantitative and qualitative. Uh, just to kind of continue along the hit parade here with types of variables, I want to dig in deeply a little bit more with uh, dependent variables and kind of give you some examples. And so those dependent variables are things that we measure. Remember, they tend to be continuous or discrete. They also tend to be either quantitative or qualitative. But there are five different categories that we oftentimes talk about for types of dependent variables. And I've given you the definitions on this slide. The next slide, I want to work through some examples with you. So a frequency category count is just how often something happens and so you could count you know by watching a video oh this happens sometimes oh don't do this with me though I shouldn't say this sometimes you'll be watching a speaker in a class you're doing class presentations and you start counting the number of ums and o's and you have little tick marks on your paper or you got a little clicker on your phone or something like that so the frequency is how something how often something occurs so don't so please don't go back and do that that would be kind of embarrassing Latency is how long it takes until a behavior occurs. And so uh, the behavior is not occurring, there's some sort of event, and then how long till it begins. And so I think that a great example of this would be while you're driving, you're driving along, you're coming up to an intersection, and you see the stoplight uh, flashes on the intersection. And latency would be the time it took from when you saw the light to when you put your foot first on the brake. And so latency would be, uh, how long it took for a behavior to occur. Duration would be, once the behavior started, how long did it last? So duration in that example would be, once you've got your foot on the brake, how long did you have it on uh, your foot on that brake? And so latency is the amount of time it takes until something happens, and duration is once it started happening, how long does it take, how long does it last? Amplitude talks about the strength of the response or the magnitude of the response, and so, you can think about someone giving you a gentle little tap on the shoulder versus an all-out punch on the shoulder, and you can understand that, that you know the the you know the behavior is a tap on the shoulder or hitting someone's shoulder, but you can understand the amplitude or the intensity is going to be different, and so um, that's like touching the brake versus slamming on the brake. You're still braking, but now we could get a measure of amplitude. We could actually, in a, in a braking situation, we could measure pressure, you know, of uh, how, how hard you're pressing on that brake pedal. And finally, choice selection is a classic, and that's really your answer from multiple options. And students are very familiar with this type of dependent variable. Every time you've taken a multiple choice test with A, B, C, or D is the correct answer, or some variation on that theme, uh, your answer in that situation is would be considered a dependent variable measure. And it's really not about frequency, latency, duration, or amplitude, but it's really your choice selection from a series of options. So let's let's dig just a little bit deeper and look at some examples. And uh, again, you know, if I go through this too quickly, you can always pause the, the screen here and come back and read these, or you can replay the video from YouTube at any time you need to. But so here are some examples. So that frequency is how often a behavior occurs. And you can look at just some examples, number of likes on a Facebook page. Latency, once you started to do something, I'm sorry, I take that back. Uh, latency is the amount of time until a behavior occurred. And so maybe you've got a new song book. Uh, how long did it take until you learned the lyrics to the new song? Um, you got a new credit card, but uh, how long did it take until the first time you used it? Okay, and so latency is the amount of time it takes until a behavior starts. Duration is that once it starts, how long does it last? So the amount of time a customer reigns brand loyal. You start playing Xbox or PS4 or something. Uh, once you started, how many hours or days did you continue playing? Amplitude, I've already given, talked about some examples about breaking. So uh, the, the amount of noise and decibels would be amplitude. Um, you could be rating someone in terms of an annual evaluation, the uh, degree of test anxiety, high, medium, or low. And so you can see there's different levels or magnitudes of amplitude. And finally, choice selection, your, your classic answers from a multiple choice test. You get a survey from Apple asking you how uh, favorable are you towards their products. You give it a score on a scale of one to four. That would be an example of choice selection. All right, finally, as we come to the conclusion of our types of variables uh, 
screencast, uh, and, and this is a little bit different use of the words as you might be used to, uh, extraneous variables and nuisance variables. And again, we're going to dig a little bit deeper into this research methodology that we're spending the semester studying. So extraneous variables and nuisance variables, hopefully you can you can tell by the depictions here are things that we don't want. Extraneous or extra, they're not part of the study. Nuisance variables are things that we're not really interested in, although we may have to account for them. And there's a couple different options with extraneous and nuisance variables. So first one here you see on the screen, you may try to control for these or perhaps incorporate into an independent variable. And so maybe you're doing a study about the usage of PS4 and gaming and uh, video entertainment. And so, uh, however, uh, although you're not interested in the age of the player, you may know that generally speaking, younger players spend more time. And so if you're not really curious about age, but you know age might have an impact, we might call age an extraneous variable or a nuisance variable there. And there's a couple different ways we could deal with it. Um, we could we could set a very narrow band of people and control for it. In other words, we're only going to study 13 to 15 year olds or 22 to 26 year olds. And so we're not going to worry about that big uh, distribution of people at different ages, but we're going to kind of control for it uh, by by having a narrow band of whatever variable we're interested in. Or uh, we could, if, if it turns out, well, maybe age might be an interesting variable to study, we could turn it into an independent variable, and we actually already have a couple options. We could have it as a continuous variable and just measure each person's age in our study. Or we could turn it into a discrete variable and have them check a box in terms of their age range. And so 13 to 15 year olds, 15 to 17 year olds, so on and so forth. And so. Really, the two options we have with extraneous variables or nuisance variables, we try to control for them by limiting somehow the range of people we might be testing, or we just turn it into an independent variable and we see if age has an effect. So, th so those are a couple different options for dealing with extraneous variables, nuisance variables. And then sometimes we've got something called a confounding variable. It's, it's very much related that acts along with the independent variable to influence the dependent variable. So let me say that one again. A confounding variable or confound is something that acts along with the independent variable to influence the dependent variable. So let me tell you a story. It's from another lifetime, but as a graduate student in my psychology graduate education, I worked with Alzheimer's disease patients and I went around the daycare centers in Southern Illinois and I did some implicit explicit memory testing. And I'm not gonna really go over all of that, but I think the, the point will become clear quickly, I hope. Uh, and so uh, I was interested in their memory performance on this little word task. It's a little bit like a crossword puzzle. You might give a, you might ask for a six letter word and uh, you give them the first two letters and you have them think about any, any six letter word that begins with those two letters. You have them generate as many as possible in a certain amount of time. And you do this with Alzheimer's patients. You do this with age matched healthy control folks. And you test the hypothesis about implicit and explicit memories. Well, what I've discovered by doing my literature search, my review of the literature, is that um, that that reading ability is actually confounded with uh, the last year in school the person completed. In other words, if um, they were a college graduate in the adult daycare center, they were exposed to probably many more words across their lifetime than let's say if they dropped out of school in the sixth grade. And so uh, reading ability in my memory study was actually a confound. And so I had to adjust for that. I had to account for that. And uh, I was able to do that, but it was a good thing that I read the literature. I looked at previous journal articles about that topic. And you know, even though I personally in my study had no interest in reading ability, I, I did want to know how well they could complete this little word task. And so I had to account for that. And if I didn't, that would have been a confound. I could have been at a poster presentation at a conference and someone said, did you make sure that the reading abilities were the same? And I'd have gone, Mm, uh, no, I didn't do that. And so again, remember that's that all else held constant from experimentation. I want a nice clean comparison of the effect of my independent variable on the dependent variable, all else held constant. And so I could have made sure that I had um, only people who had a college 
college educated uh, reading level, or I could have turned it into a, in a variable and had uh, different levels of that independent variable of reading ability. So anyway, uh, you'll learn about those by reading the literature, and that's why we do that before we do a study. All right, well, that's it for types of variables and Psych 321 research methods.